<laughs> that's all you're gonna I, I don't get. Know if, are you being sarcastic? That's or all you're gonna get. No, I, I get, I often get like sick from drinking alcohol. Like there's a very small type, the very small percentage of alcohols that I can accept. Most of them will like make me sick. Really? So I gotta like try it first. So okay. I'm like, oh good, you started off small. Okay, oh, so cool. what, what, uh, what kind of alcohols can you not drink? Do you know like you just can't drink? Um, I get sick from wine. Beer, I don't want to drink because it's the the concentration's too low, so you won't feel anything. So it's just like fuck <laughs> oh, that. Okay. Biodiol is a big no. <laughs> oh Like no. basically the lower and upper extremes. So like it tends to be the stuff in the middle that's okay. So this is actually like might be okay. Actually, well, uh, whiskey. I mean, how often have you had whiskey before? I've had it before. Whiskey or rum or um. There's one other one like tequila? those middle ground. Oh, not tequila. Vodka. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> there's one other like middle ground alcohol that I think is acceptable. Hey, go no. Thanks, Justin. Catherine. All right. Have we actually, started? on the on the Baijiu thing, I'm gonna actually change my mind because, uh, like her before, I was a fearful of Baijiu, mm -hmm. but after going to Mao Tai and actually experiencing really refined Baijiu, it's not what you think unless you've tried the best. So you've been to like the Mao Tai? Yeah, I was just uh, in. Factory. I was just in the uh, in Guizhou. Oh. And I just uh, had a trip in the Mao Mao Tai uh, area uh -huh. city, and we went to at the actual. Uh, the Mao Tai Baijiu place and there's lots and hundreds of brands of Baijiu and uh, you know those are really like refined ones mm -hmm. compared to what you find in the convenience stores so mm -hmm. yeah they're very different so you got converted I well I got I was uh, I, I lose I lost my fear of Baijiu <laughs> you yeah. had a fear I had a fear yeah I was knocked out by the factory boss <laughs> uh, like 2007 when I started going to the factory and one of the, my experience was in after dinner, well, during dinner, the factory boss, well, he was trying to buy me over, right? Because I was working for a company. Uh -huh. And he was just pouring me by Joe, small little cup like that. One, finish it. Another one. That's it, right? Oh, she said, finish it first. All right, I finish it. Another one comes. And I was just done. I was knocked out, really. Wait, how many I did you have? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it was so pungent. It was kind of disgusting. Uh huh. Yeah. But I did it because of like trying to be nice, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> this time I, I wasn't knocked out. There was no pungent smell. It was just a sensation of like the alcohol and that's it. They gave you the good stuff. The good stuff. Well, this is yeah. supposedly some good stuff right here, this okay. whiskey. So cheers. Cheers. Thanks for coming to the show, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's an honor. It's an honor. Oh, still got to get my uh, chaser ready. Here's <laughs> Come on, Gathered. Come on, Gathered. Try know, it without a chaser first. Someone tried to convert me to Baijiu literally two days ago during the Dragon Boat Festival. Oh. They gave me like the good stuff in like the fancy box, mm -hmm. you know, couldn't do it. Like, really? oh my oh, gosh. <sighs> well, before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about the difference between uh, being a podcaster and a YouTuber. Mm -hmm. um, and for listeners, I don't know, you both are uh, YouTubers on, uh, on YouTube, obviously, uh, making video content. And you guys make a lot of travel content, uh, Content about China is that correct? Is it? Yeah. Is that accurate to describe? Yeah. So okay, let's get let's. Mm. Where do we want to start here? No, ladies Catherine? first. <laughs> okay, so just fill me in a little bit um, about your channel because I saw the video you did on Noel's channel. Yeah. Um, and it was quite good. So, kind of, what is your whole angle here with YouTube? I guess. So my YouTube channel is kind of like a travel travel channel in the sense that I go to a lot of places and I experience a lot of things. But it's kind of combining travel with like life in China because I'm not just here for a few months or a few years. Like I'm planning on staying for a long time. Mm -hmm. I have a Chinese boyfriend, like like live in the China life, you know. So I trying to I guess I kind of combine those two different elements. Like there's the element of exploring and traveling and experiencing this new country. And then there's also a lot of elements of what is it like to live in China. Okay. So I kind of bring those two things together. Is and, there a little bit of um like, I guess for, like, your average watchers, right, on YouTube, is there a little bit you feel of, like, that kind of shock value is, it would be an aggressive way to put it, but is there a little bit of shock value? Because here you are, you know, you're, you're like, straight up white girl, right? <laughs> um, American, and here you are in China, like, making all this Chinese content, you have a Chinese boyfriend. Yeah. Is there a little bit of people, you think, like, people will find interest in that? Like, hey, what is this girl up to? Like, why is she here? And instead of like, let's say, if it was a Chinese girl making the same content, it probably wouldn't be as interesting in yeah. a way for video. I've gotten that kind of feedback from a lot yeah. of people that they think it's really interesting or unique. 
and I have shared a lot of these videos on Facebook with some of my, you know, some of my old classmates will see them or like friends, family. And a lot of people are just really interested in this kind of story, you know, because of course my perspective would be much different than a Chinese person. You know, I'm bringing like this foreign set of eyes to this country mm. and kind of showing everyone all these different and unique things. Like, for example, one of my hobbies is biking in the countryside. So I'm not just showing everyone like typical tourist destinations. I'll just go and like make my own path basically and go and see what I find. And I run into all kinds of interesting people and interesting things. And then I just like put the it on real YouTube. China, right? Yeah, the, the real China, <laughs> so to speak. So I love doing that kind of exploring. And of course, you know, on YouTube, if your videos get spread quite far out, you will get every type of opinion under the sun. So, of course, people will come at me saying like, oh, you're brainwashed or this is CCP. CCP propaganda or this or that like those are just unavoidable but overall the feedback is quite positive people are like intrigued by the story you know yeah you get a few of those crazy ones in there uh even even my videos which have not been widely watched as yours but like even mine like you get a few of those in there and it gets real toxic real quick yeah if you actually engage with them I haven't thank god I, yeah. I refuse <laughs> to engage in the comment section or even to look at the comment section now but like but if you engage with that, it can get into a real toxic rabbit hole real quick, right? Yeah. That's but, that's the thing with, with, with YouTube, I think. You don't even look at your comments anymore because no. you have so many. Oh, that's so sad. It is sad oh in a way, gosh. right? Because, yeah, this is this is the rough thing about it, right? Because they're overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. Um, But it's like the few bad ones just like frustrate me so much because of the shit they say. And it's just like... Like, I don't even want to, like, come across it. And it's just, like, that's, like, human nature, right? You can have, like, a hundred great comments, positive comments, and, like, two really negative ones. But those yeah. two, you'll remember. Whereas the positive ones, you almost, like, don't even remember. You take for granted almost. Yeah. It's terrible. What about you, Noel? Here you are, and on your channel, you're making content about China and Xinjiang, mm. which is, like, kind of the mother load of anything, like, controversial and divisive politically these days right like that is a huge topic right and it's it's funny because like here you are you're talking about like toxicity and like people coming after you <laughs> like you, you did, did you not get any of that with the xinjiang videos you made um the for the xinjiang videos what i got was in fact more tame more civilized really all they did was say that i'm a you know ccp shield uh, i'm spreading chinese propaganda um, they want the Singapore uh, internal affairs or internal security to arrest me when I go back to Singapore. Well, that's not very tame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how is that no, tame? No, that's, that's tame. That's fine. Okay. They never, they never went we, after my business. Oh, they never actually took action. Right? To actually, yeah, oh. that's it. Yeah. Whereas, like the Macross thing, the models that actually yeah. like hurt you. Like, it hurt me because uh, that affected my brand's reputation. Mm. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. I get that. But how do you? So does that deter you? And this. Question goes to you, Catherine, too. Like, like, do getting comments like this, does it like deter you at all or make you second think the content you make whenever you're kind of putting up new videos or thinking about what to do next? Does me? it factor in at all? Yeah. Um, well, for me... Or does it give you extra juice to like even no, go even harder? Uh, for me, the Macross saga has sort of tired me down and I thought the best way is just to just let it go. That means I'm raising the white flag. I'm giving up. But for the YouTube contents, uh, nope. Because, like I said, those comments are pretty tame. And uh, as long as currently it's not coming to a stage of being doxxed or, you know, life-threatening, I guess it's it's fine. <laughs> so can you describe a little bit of, like, the videos you shot in Xinjiang, I guess? If you want to talk about that. the Yeah, I... Like, just for the listeners who don't know or might not be familiar with your channel. I mean, they got a bunch of views. Um... And it was right at the height of the whole kind of re-energized Xinjiang controversy, right? Right. So yeah, I was in Xinjiang because um, obviously there is that rhetoric going on that I felt was totally nonsense. So the only, in order for me to talk about it, I thought I had to be in Xinjiang, do some filming and prove that I was there to be able to speak about it with some, uh, I guess, uh, magnitude or some, some sense of... Uh, was worth looking for like authority yeah authority right so so yeah i went over there i visited three places uramchi uh kashgar and hotan and i basically shot uh photographs and footages of the people living their normal lives 
So, yeah, I mean, if there was things like genocide and forced labor going on, I wasn't seeing it. All right. Of course, they, 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 they will tell you, oh, of course, but you have been only to the cities. You have not gone out there. It's happening mm. out there. But yeah. hey, I flew over Uromchi and I was filming the ground. On the day of my flight, it was clear skies. I could see directly on the ground. There were no clouds blocking my way. I was filming like 18, 20, 50, 50 minutes of footages and I was seeing barren land. Land that is in, uh, inhabitable for humans. So who would go out there to build a camp to house people? It doesn't make sense. Well, I mean, that's what I really respect about what you both do. I think, I mean, what you part of what you do, or if not like one of the main things you do on your channel is vlog, right? And you guys achieve something that I think like this podcast can never achieve. Just the format of like podcasting can never achieve. Because here we are, we're sitting in a studio. You know, no one really knows watching, really knows where we are. They just have to kind of take our word for it. But you guys film yourselves and vlog on site, wherever you guys go. Whatever city you're in, whatever building you're in, whatever whatever country you go to. And there's something really kind of tactile and like tangible about that where people can really, it's much, obviously it's much more believable because people can kind of live those experiences with you. And I think a lot of the kind of go-to criticism about whenever people are talking about anything that's controversial or political is like, well, how do you know you're not there? A lot of like even this podcast, like w not every episode we talk about like political or controversial things. A lot of it is about self-help, self-development, personal issues. But whenever we do try to explore a little bit of kind of these like kind of politically divisive things, I mean, you, you find out like how divided the world really is. And it's, to me, it's, it's been borderline depressing. And I don't know if that, experience kind of really resonates with you at all being content creators yourself but i just feel like the world has always been divided but just because of how interconnected we all are and how fast information spreads now like we're seeing all the divisiveness not that it's a new thing but it's just that we're we're able to see it now and it's overwhelming at times so i don't know like i don't like like on youtube i think it's just a whole different animal because you're actually putting your face on there you're making videos, right? You're putting your name to it. It's like, how how much of it is like, does it personally affect you? Or does it? I mean, I think you're just gonna get those comments. There's just really nothing you can do about it because the media from both sides is so charged. Like in China, for example, the media is always beating down on the US, talking about how terrible the US is. I'm always getting comments on Chinese social media about how everyone in the US has a gun, how the US is so dangerous. I mean, yes, there's bad things in the US, but I mean, welcome to Earth, right? Like, yeah. The media will always overemphasize certain things. So on Chinese social media, I got to go up against people who are telling me I'm a spy, who are constantly harassing me. About on Chinese social media. Yes, Chinese social media. People say I'm a spy. So it's because the two countries' media outlets have just been beating on each other. Like Chinese media is always talking about how terrible the U.S. is. The U.S. media is always talking about how terrible China is. Like, for example, you know about the Japan nuclear wastewater mm -hmm. thing, right? So... It's really not mentioned in media in the U.S. at all. No. But I guarantee you, if it was China, all the U.S. would jump on it. I mean, they don't really necessarily even care about the issue itself. It's just like China, China, China. We don't like China. So on YouTube, I'm always getting those comments about, oh, you're just paid by the CCP. Oh, you're brainwashed, this, that. And on Chinese social media, I'm also getting all kinds of annoying comments. It's just part of life. Like, so there's, so really... there's like, it's a lose-lose scenario in a way, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're always going gonna... to get that. Yeah. But the overwhelming feedback is positive. And there's one other thing, too, that people tend to not put their opinion in the comments if they're like middle ground. You know, it's the people that really support you and the people that really don't support you. They are the ones in the comments. Yeah. The extremists on yes. both ends. I yeah. Guess. So there's a lot of <laughs> quiet audience members who are enjoying the videos and they just move on. I mean, I watch a lot of YouTube and how many videos do I leave a comment on? Not very many, honestly. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I'm just a quiet audience for almost all these videos. And I mean, if anything, if a video is getting a lot of dislikes or a lot of negative comments i mean that's a sign that youtube is really pushing it like far you know if you're getting a lot of that negative content if you're getting a lot of those negative comments it means that your video is getting pushed to a new audience that maybe isn't so accustomed to seeing a positive lens of china so it just kind of comes with the territory like okay youtube keep on promoting my video like that's fine like the more of those negative comments come in the more i know oh wow this video must be doing well like 
my two best performing videos are the ones that have the most dislikes and the most hate because I mean those videos got promoted so far out beyond my core audience. So even when you thumbs down a video, it's actually helping the video being spread. I'm not sure that it helps it spread. Works? So what I mean is that this video is very popular and it has been spread out very far, and that is bringing in a very wide audience. So okay, so going to your most popular videos, what have they been about? So the most popular one is just a kind of my like backstory, I guess, like why I moved to China, what I like about China, et cetera. And people are all in the comments talking about how the CCP must have paid you to do this video or blah, blah, blah. And the video's got over 100 dislikes, which is quite a lot for a small creator like myself. <laughs> but it's just like, that's inevitable, you know? I mean, the videos that only have one or two dislikes, they barely made it outside of my core audience. They really weren't promoted very far at all. So if you can't handle that criticism, then your videos are just constantly going to be constrained to your own audience. Like, Mm, that's a good you point. know, you're yeah. going to get criticism if your videos get pushed out far and wide. You just got to kind of deal with it, you know, whatever. So so why now I'm curious, like, why did you move to China? There was. What are you <laughs> laughing about? <laughs> there are a lot of reasons, I guess I could just if I'm going to kind of use that way, the if I'm going to use that video as an example, the way it summarized it is basically I love exploring. I love going to new places and seeing interesting things. And China is just a really great place to do that because it's such a massive country. There's so many different provinces and so many different like local cultures and different geography, different styles of architecture, different foods. There's just so much exploring you can do here and you can use the same language basically to get around. It's amazing. Like if you were to try to do the same thing in Europe, I mean, there's all kinds of language barriers and you're going between different countries and things like that. But here it's just this huge territory with so much to explore. So that was one thing because I love biking. You know, I love to go out in the countryside and just bike and explore. I've been all over the edges of Nanjing where I live and all kinds of other cities. There's always something new to explore. So that's a big thing for me. And another one is the language aspect. Like, I just love living my life in another language. I think that's fun and exciting. It just adds like another challenging element to life. Like, I wanted to find a partner who speaks another language. I wanted to have friends in another language, do my studies, my job, everything in a foreign language. I think that's really fun, really exciting. So those were the two like main reasons. And I'm in the environmental field, environmental engineering. So I feel like that's a, a field that is growing in popularity and kind of like becoming more emphasized by the government. You know, oh, if sure. the government wants something to happen, you know how the government works here. You know, yeah. <laughs> like if they want something to happen, it will. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. So there's been so much efforts being taken in the past like decade or so to really improve the environment here. And there's just a lot of great opportunities. I mean, China's kind of the world's factory, right? Why is the environment in the U.S. so nice? Well, a big reason is because we have kind of pushed a lot of our industries, our polluting industries, off to other countries, to Mexico, to Bangladesh, to China. So, I mean, and then now you're waving a yeah. stick over them because you did that. You know, like why are you making so much pollution? Yeah, exactly. It's like we gave you all the stuff to make, but why are you making it? You know, it's like yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot of really interesting opportunities in the environmental field here. So those are the main reasons. Wow, that's really interesting. So what I gather from it is you're you're a girl who likes to kind of push your comfort zones a little bit yeah yeah yeah. right live, live for that so china was a, a good option i feel like okay so how did you uh i know you have a video because i saw it um in the recommended section i didn't tap into it yet but mm -hmm. it was a video you made like how you met your boyfriend like so you have you have a chinese boyfriend you met him here yeah we met in china and so he's never been to the u.s the u.s won't give him <laughs> they won't give him a visa <laughs> so yeah. so how'd you guys meet like what was this what's the story behind that we met online Okay. Oh yeah. Nothing. Honestly, it's not that exciting of a story. Unfortunately, nothing. Nothing super spicy. But yeah, we just met online, and and then did he speak any English at that time? No, and he doesn't really speak English now either. Okay. He's just kind of working his way there, step by step. Wow. I spoke Chinese already at that point, so I wow. already knew Chinese when we met. And you speak? I, I'm I'm assuming you speak it pretty well now, pretty fluently. Yeah. I mean, I was pretty fluent then too. I'd already dated two other Chinese guys. I'd been oh, learning wow. for like okay. yeah, I'd been learning for like three or four years. At so that it's point. like yellow fever reversed <laughs> oh my god <laughs> edit that out all the haters are gonna come for me like ooh. no i think it's great honest. we, need, we need more honest. of that yeah honest we need more of that because there's that stereotype right like like white guys like asian girls and you mm -hmm. see it all the time but you you don't see as much um and I'm, i don't mean like white girl in a derogatory man i mean yeah, i'm yeah. just saying like white you don't see as many white girls dating asian guys no, you just don't true. see it that is a lot much, rarer yeah right so I love it. I love it when I see it. I applaud it. <laughs> and I was laughing just now because he, I asked you the same question on straight talk. So her answer is consistent. 
Okay. She's honest. Wait, what'd you ask her on Straight Talk? Same oh, thing, how, same, okay. same question, yeah. Yeah, yeah why'd I come to yeah, China? Exactly. So, It'd be funny if she had a whole different story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll, I'll be like, shock. Oh. Yeah, you shouldn't have done it over Zoom. That's all I can say. You should have yeah. done it in person, then you get the real story. And over some liquor. Yes, yeah. cheers. cheers. Oh, oh, you need some more, yeah. you know. You drink quick. Right, let me pour you out. No, but the uh, environmental sciences thing is something I'm actually very fascinated with. Um, I didn't know that. And I, I've been wanting to get um, some environmental kind of science professionals and experts onto the show to talk oh, really? about those issues. Yeah, it is a huge issue here. And I think living in China, and I mean, let me just drink this real quick. Living in China, even those of us who live here, you know, one of the main criticisms is about pollution, right? And we see it. I mean, there's definitely a pollution problem here. Yeah. And, but I think what the narrative, especially in the West, that doesn't get told a lot is that actually China is leading the way now in protecting the environment. The kind of initiatives they're taking, and I think the amount of resources and money and subsidies they're providing for a lot of companies to come in and do well and create renewable energy options or whatever it is. I mean, you would know far more about this <laughs> than I do. But I see it as a periphery, even as an investor, I see the push that the government is making and the steps that they're taking. and that that's not really kind of a story that gets told a lot and yeah. i'll kind of want it and if there's any place that would be such a great like petri dish for a lack of a better term to kind of see this whole environmental like um experiment go down i think it'd be china right yeah and so like what is like how how much how involved are you a student right now or are you working professionally in this field like what's your involvement i'm a student right now but i'm going to be graduating soon so Oh, I'm so excited to graduate. I've been in school way too long. I don't know if you are aware, but getting a master's degree in China takes three years. It is such a long process. But I haven't been, I don't know, what, how would you put this? I guess I'm just not a good student because I'm always doing stuff on the side. <laughs> Ever since I got here, I've been doing all kinds of part-time stuff. Like I have an internship that I've been working with since 2017. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing a lot of like conference interpreting for them at like various environmental events. Not so much in the last year because of the pandemic. Like a translator? But, yeah, like conference interpreting, you know, like the, the person in the box yeah. in the back of the room, like someone's on stage talking. Oh, and they have or, like their earphones they're yeah, putting yeah. in. You're the one talking into that. Yeah, yeah. I've done that. That's and awesome. also the one where like you say a few sentences and then I say a few sentences, like the back and forth. So I've done a lot of conference interpreting for them, like translating a lot of materials for them, tons of environmental education stuff. Like I led this little, I guess you would call it a little after school class for a couple of schools near my university where every week I would go in and teach the kids about all kinds of environmental concepts and things like that. I did that for a whole semester. Mm -hmm. So I did all kinds of environmental education stuff. So I've, I've been staying busy outside of just school, you know, like I work on my research and outside of that, I've been doing all this interning stuff. Okay. So from your vantage point, because before I went on a rant about how good or how much energy and, and, and power China is putting into this whole like, kind of environmental resources and, renewable energy like is that correct or from your vantage point what are you what are you seeing actually happen here in terms of any steps or progress being made on that front well there's one really interesting change that's been taking place is that in the past maybe like a few decades ago or even as close as maybe 10 years ago the government kind of didn't want to listen to the environmental groups and didn't want to take all the effort and all the resources to deal with these problems but recently because my internship works with a lot of like civil society organizations so I can like see this happening and they tell me about it too. The government kind of switched their view of this, I suppose you would say. Like the government actually really wants to put that effort in now. Like they care that these standards are being met. They care that these environmental issues are being resolved. So for example, a lot of the civil size, a lot of the civil society organizations, they will be on the ground finding problems. Like for example, illegal fishing during the fish like breeding system fish breeding season or for example a factory that's polluting something that they shouldn't be you know a lot of these civil or civil society organizations are on the ground finding problems mm -hmm. and then they will report the problem to the government and the government is responsible for taking care of the you know the punishment afterward or taking care of some of the enforcement related stuff so before it was always civil society versus the government you know they, they were kind of they weren't really a cooperative relationship it was like pushing back against each other you know and now it's really switched to a, a very collaborative relationship. They're and, almost like working 
with or for the government in a way. Yeah, exactly. Because the government makes the standards, the government does the punishments, the government handles the fines and all these things. But it's difficult for the government to actually be on the ground looking for all these problems all the time. You know, so that's something that civil society organizations do, at least the ones that are part of my internship. That's what they are. How many of these society, civil, uh, what, what are they called? Civil society? What are they called again? Civil society organizations. Yeah. I'm trying How to think of a good word. It's just kind of like. Okay, so that's yeah. like the, the English translation in, from Chinese, right? I'm sure there's a proper English word for it. I just honestly have like blanked right now. No, but that, like, that's good enough. Like, yeah. how, how many of there are there? Is it very widespread? Are there a lot of people on the ground? Like, in all of around? China? Oh, I have no idea. Countless ones. Just the ones I'm familiar with is probably like five or six. So I can get more direct information from them. Like I've gone and visited a few of them. I've made like videos for them, like showing some of the work they were doing. But in all of China, I can't even count how many of them there are. Okay, so there's a bunch of them. Yeah, there's a lot. Do you have do you have any insight into um, how well the government is actually enforcing? Like once these civil society organizations like report something, like how well is the government, from your perspective, um, actually enforcing the fines or the punishments or the consequences or whatever, and as, correcting these mistakes? As far as I can see, they are. It's not a me versus you situation anymore like as long as they report this information the government does seem to actually be taking the steps to deal with the polluter or deal with the illegal fishermen i mean they've been doing a lot of i guess a lot of collaborative work in this sense like the government really truly cares about enforcing these standards as opposed to just putting them there for the sake of like completing an obligation mm. like it seems that that was kind of a trend in the past like okay we're just going to crank out this standard and then for example you'd have the environmental inspectors show up to the factory on this day and as long as the water meets the standard on this day, okay, we're done, we're good. And then all the, subs all the subsequent days, the factory might just be dumping waste straight in the river and nobody cares. Like it was a very surface level kind of obligatory situation. But in the past like decade or two, that's really been changing. Like the government is genuinely invested in making sure that the environment is improving. And obviously it's not perfect. Like there's still a very long road to go, but it's definitely on an upward trend. As opposed to like in the US, for example, under the, the Trump regime or whatever you want to call it, you know, <laughs> Trump regime. regime. Administration. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> my, my internship has a lot of organizations in the U.S. They're actually headquartered there. And I was always seeing that kind of feedback coming out of them like, oh, my gosh, this is such an uphill battle because the government is undoing so much environmental regulations that we used to have. So in the U.S., it's like we do have a very good environmental situation, but it's it's beginning to go on like a downhill now, or at least it was during the Trump administration. It may be improving with Biden. That was a real big problem during those four years. They were always saying, oh my gosh, like they're undoing this regulation or that regulation. They're doing all these rollbacks. And it, it's just such a struggle. Like we're kind of slipping back. We're losing our progress. But in China, you know, they're on the uphill. Yes, it's slow. Yes, there's a ton of work that needs to be done. But it's really not as bad as the Western media would like to make it out to be. This is a, a dead horse that I've, been, I've beaten to death on this show. But it's, it's really one of... Um my criticisms of a four-year administration and a system that's based off of, you know, popularity is that you, you, you put certain policies in place and after four years, someone else comes into office and kind of reshuffles or re undoes everything. You yeah, know? that really is a problem. So you keep running in place. Yeah. You keep running in place. And, and, you know, the question is like, what kind of real progress are you really making? And look, there's a lot of criticisms and legitimate criticisms you can make of the government here in China. But one thing you cannot say is that they don't get shit done because they do. I mean, <laughs> yes. that's, that's one thing you can never say about China is that they don't get shit done. They get shit done. Yeah. And they get shit done real fast. I guess the proof is in the pudding, right? So yeah. you just look at the, yeah. just look at America and just look at China. I mean, just look at the place itself. Yeah, but it's, right. it's easy for you to say that. And this goes on to another thing that I think you guys are, I mean, there's a bunch of people who love to travel and love to explore the world. I mean, there's a lot of them out there, um, you guys included. But if we're looking at the entirety of people, I mean, the human race, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a rarer breed that people actually venture out. Agree. To actually explore. And... You even made a video, I think, on your channel about brainwashing. And it's like about seeing with your own eyes and ears. Yeah. And to your point, Catherine, before, it's like you like pushing yourself outside of your comfort zones. Yeah. I've never, I, have, I, have, I don't think I've talked to anybody that 
really has exemplified that more than you. I mean, like, you just like like to go to a place where you don't really like. You're just learning a new language, and you know, you're you're dating a boyfriend that doesn't even speak your native language. I mean, that to me, that to a lot of people would be very interesting. But I think most people would never even entertain that idea of actually doing that, right? And yeah. you're living it. And Noel, you 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 talk about like you know not. Like getting the information for yourself in this day and age, we everyone knows, right? This is also a dead horse I've beaten to death on this show. is is about my mistrust and growing mistrust in mainstream media on either side, on any side, because you, obviously you know you're getting a very tainted point of view. Um, but it's the idea of like, okay, I'm actually going to go out, and it's the, it's the confidence to go out and like believe with your own, own eyes and ears, and your willingness to actually travel to places to see for yourself. So what you just said is about like, oh, we can see it. We can see it. But the main thing is most people don't see it because they're living in their own cultural bubble and their own social bubble. And they don't, we have the privilege, you know, I grew up in the States, you know, so did you, Catherine. You're from Singapore, right? Yeah. So I was like, and we, we traveled a bunch and we make that effort to kind of see and actually put ourselves in those situations. But that's not most people, I would have to assume. Yeah, you, you you said it right. And to add to that, even myself, I'm not as well traveled as I guess other people, right? I've I've known people who have gone to a hundred other countries, right? I've I've been to less than ten, so uh, even myself, I have uh, not been able to experience th most of the world. That's why I'm actually trying to make it up by doing all these podcasts on my street talk where I meet different people from different places. I just done a, there's a, there's a new premiere coming up uh, on all this recording tonight. Uh, I met a new Cameroon friend. So I found out that uh, in Cameroon, it's not what the, me the media is painting it to be. It's not a place where there's hungry children and poverty. I mean, there's, there's poverty, but not to that state. He says that Cameroon is just like any other city or any other country. So for me, it's like, oh yeah, so... I've not been there. I got to trust his word and I, I, I can trust it because he's Cameroon. So, yeah. So is that the whole kind of um, motivation or genesis behind your, your YouTube channel is that you're just trying to go out and you know, just open up your mind and just well, I get think, new information? I think for me, I want to start journal journaling, doing journals. So I have always wanted to do journaling of my life, but I'm very bad at keeping a diary. Mm. I've tried it. I've really tried it. I tried penning down on a book, but mm. after a few days, I just stopped. <laughs> Either it's because I'm too busy, too tired, all the excuses I can give you. Uh, so I thought YouTube is a good way for me to, you know, just fire up the camera, record something, exp I mean, share my experiences, right? And if I have, uh, you know, if I can share what I think about something that is recorded, I can journal it and I can come back, you know, five years from now and then see what I've said before and compared to what I'm thinking now. So I think that's a is a very good uh, instrument that is available to all of us, and it doesn't mean that uh, you have to use it to do it just because uh, YouTube is gonna be about getting subscribers and getting a, a monetization. No, I mean you can anybody can do a YouTube if you know how to use the instrument. Everything is there for you. It's how you use it that counts. Do you guys get into a lot of debates though, um, with people or with friends around you when you make your content? Is that like something? Oh, yeah. Really? You get in debates, what, in the comment section? Uh, no, with friends and family. Oh, with friends and family. Yeah. I thought we were talking about YouTube. But friends what do your friends and family say? What kind, what kind of debate? Um, well, uh, mostly it's that, uh, you know, don't talk politics. Mm. Uh, don't, uh, don't, they are trying to tell me that I don't know everything really because it might be, it might be true. There's a chance it's true. You know, I just don't know. That's the way they are uh, receiving it. Being, I get that a lot. Being in Singapore. I get that right? a lot they, they, Because they are in Singapore, they, they are fed the news in Singapore. They are not going out. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what they tell me. So, I mean, and I'm here trying to tell them that it's not like that. But they, okay, just take care. But uh, don't, just don't, just stay out of it. You know? Well, I think we have to be very careful, right? Um, I, I'm not going to speak for you guys, but for myself, like, we have to be very careful because we can end up very easily becoming the very thing that we're like criticizing. And, you know, this is a realization that I've, I've had recently is that, 
you know, if you're going to talk to anybody and you're going to, if you really want to have an honest conversation, both sides, whoever you're talking to, myself included, we have to first acknowledge, openly acknowledge that we could be wrong, that we don't know everything, and that our whole position can be flawed. Like we have to acknowledge that that possibility is there. As hard as as it is, as as little as maybe we think that that is the case, we have to acknowledge that that is a real possibility. And if both people can acknowledge that, then you have the potential to start from an honest place having a conversation. But if you're talking to somebody, and let's say we're talking about China or we're talking about whatever, and they're completely on the other end of the spectrum in terms of their belief, and they're like, "Well, no, you're just wrong. No, 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 no. you're wrong. You're wrong." Well, you can't start from an honest place, and、um, and that could be us. It could be the other way around. If I'm just like, "Oh no, you're wrong. You're wrong. I know what it's really like. You're to- totally wrong." Well, I have to be willing to admit that my position could be flawed. I don't know everything. And that it's possible I could be wrong, and then we can start from whatever. We then we start from a more honest ground. What you just said can be summarized by Neil deGrasse Tyson's quote that I really love. Oh, I love him. Okay. Oh, so, to know enough to think you're right, but not know enough to know you're wrong. Say that again. <laughs> you gotta know enough.、Uh. To think you are right, but not know enough to know you are wrong. But not know enough to know that you're wrong. Is this advice? What is this? Yeah, no, he's, that, he's, he's saying that's the problem, right? No, that's no, no. He's not saying that's problem. He's saying he's saying that the most difficult thing in life is to know enough to think you are right, right? So we are we are gathered with lots of knowledge, and we think we are right about it. Right. For example, you have an equation, or you have all the、mm-hmm. uh, things presented to you, and you are being asked a question, and you have you know enough, right, to think that that is the right answer, right? But you got to get, you got to give that bit of space that you might not know enough to know that actually you're wrong, and that applies to this discussion. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know if you're misquoting him or not because I. The, No, okay, I, I get what you're saying. I feel like we need to look up this quote. Like, yeah, I'm look, we need to fact check this quote because、okay. no, I get what you're saying. I'm sure it's something along those lines, but it's the same thing that goes. It's、um, and there's another quote right from I think a philosopher back in the ancient times. He was like, or or maybe not even ancient times. Someone said this. It's like I know I'm intelligent because I know I don't know everything.、Mm. You know, and it's knowing. I think it's not knowing. It's knowing enough to know you don't know everything. I mean, that makes more sense, right? Oh、uh, yeah, like hold on. I will. I will、uh, check it out. But we get the spirit. We get the spirit. Yeah, I get the spirit. I'm like curious what the yeah, original the quote、yeah. is now. Find this thing. <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to come <laughs>、yeah. on and be like, "No." Who is that? <laughs> who is Neil deGrasse Tyson? You don't know who Neil deGrasse Tyson is? No, you guys even put his middle name in there, so I don't know. I guess no. That's how he really goes. Like everyone、deal. just calls him Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> knowing enough to think you are right, but not knowing enough to know you are wrong. That's what I said, right? Yeah, but this wait, not knowing. Yeah, but this is your notes. This is what you. Punched in, yeah, because I copied it verbatim. Oh, yeah. Is it just me, or does it seem a little like the way it's worded is a little bit confusing? Oh, it doesn't make sense to me either. <laughs> right? How about this, guys?、Hold、two,、on. two versus one, though. Two versus one. Hold on, hold on. I got, I got ammo. I got ammo. I don't know who Neil deGrasse Tyson is, but this feels like one of those. No, fake, it's irrelevant who he is, but it's like deep quotes. Like、I、no, but like... it should be you know you know enough to know that you don't know everything, right? Yeah, it's not like, you don't、exactly. know enough to know you're not you don't. Yeah. Know All right, we got we got to figure this out. Yeah, we got we got, hold on. How are you in your photo album? Just like Google it. <laughs> What tangent you know are we going、Because、on here? You know why? Because I got、here? the video, dude. Oh my goodness. We're gonna get to the bottom of this. I want to know now, Neil. <laughs> for real, who is this DeGrasse、right. Tyson guy? Is knowing enough about a subject to think you're right, but not enough about the subject to know you're wrong. Get it? That is what he said.、Yeah. Then your quote is accurate. Yeah,、Doesn't、but I feel、sense. like it's. I feel it's a little flawed. I feel what he said is a little. No,、flawed. but I, I get it. I get it too. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So, yeah.、Okay. yeah. Good job. That was good. Cheers. Cheers, <laughs> man. Yeah. So、How、he's basically just、you? saying don't it, don't it, learn too much no, stuff, otherwise it, you'll it, prove it yourself wrong. Means, like it, it's in, in a, a nutshell,、advice. it basically means keep that 
don't be don't be extreme and say that I am right and you are wrong. For sure, you are wrong. I am always right. He's just trying to say that you know, yeah. leave that little bit that oh maybe 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 I'm wrong. Maybe you're this right. This is really bothering Catherine. Now. It, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, you're right. It, does, it kind of doesn't make any sense, right? I because feel like then he's advising me to not, not learn. Yeah, not learn no, so no, much. No. He's like, he's like, don't learn enough. <laughs> so <laughs> one of the great challenges in life is knowing enough to think you're right, but not enough to know you're, you're wrong. wrong. Yeah, it's a little weird. I feel like this is just one of those like fake but totally deep things. But again, I don't know who Neil deGrasse Tyson is. But, but we I, get what he's trying to say. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. the important. That's, that's the, 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 the takeaway, right? Yeah. What we're taking away from it. Yeah. That's the important thing. But that's that's so true, right? I think it's yeah. so easy, and I'm guilty of this. And it's so easy to get caught up, especially in the heat of a debate or a heat of a conversation, to be so firmly planted, you know, on that I am whether I'm have the moral high ground or that I'm right about something, you know, and that you get so defensive about what you're saying, and then whenever you get defensive about it. It's so easy for that conversation to spiral out of control and turn into an argument, right? And once it turns into an argument and once it gets into that zone, it's not productive anymore. It's not productive anymore because everyone just shuts down, right? And everyone just goes into defense and you're protecting your own your own ego, you're protecting your your own, you know, your your face, your 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 beliefs and everything. And I just think of it as like I think of I think of like our our view of the world, right? Our view of knowledge as like if we look, look look at space, and we look at all the planets, we look at all the asteroids, all the uh, cloud cus- clusters, all the stars out there. There's a lot of matter out there, but there's so much more just empty space than there is matter. And I feel like that's how we have our information. Like there's there's so much information in the world, and everything is so complex, and there's so many different shades. And there's so much nuance that it's impossible for our minds to kind of just really absorb and comprehend and even know it all. And what we do is our, how our minds work, how, how, it's how it's always worked, is it helps us simplify the information around us so that we can understand it and that we can absorb it. So what it does is there's so much more empty space between the actual information that we know. And we just know little bits but our mind frames it in a way where it kind of consolidates that information and removes all that empty space and just consolidates everything and grossly oversimplifies the information so that we can understand. And that's the information we work off of to understand the world. And it's a very flawed, it's a very incomplete and inaccurate picture, but that's the picture we have. I think that's the picture we all have. And whether you're right or wrong, whether you believe in this or that, Whenever we engage in debate and discussion, it's always with that working in our minds. You know, it's it's always with so much more that we don't know than we do know. And as humans, we we walk, we run around, and we just kind of argue with each other all the time. And it's like, what do we all actually know? Like, we none of us know enough, but yet we still have to live. We still have to operate. We still have to have our own belief systems. Because that's just how we're wired. And it gets really crazy. Like some people can be more measured about it and more mindful that that's there. But then I think I think probably most people don't even really bother to, to think about that and just go off. And they just go off in their own little rabbit holes. They go off into their own extremes. And I think that's where things get very dicey. Right? I don't know. You guys have any? Am I just ranting yeah, here? Is, guys no, that is, that <laughs> is, no, no, we're, we're listening. <laughs> no, that is, I guess, uh, it's the 80-20 rule. 80% of the people are not like that, and 20% are like that, and the and vice versa. So, it, it brings to mind about, I guess, the pyramid. I like pyramids. to always use the pyramid an analogy, all right? Okay. And apply it to everyday life. The fact that uh, there is a big base and a small top, it just means that there are more people doing certain things on that base and then there's less people doing other things on the top. What do I mean? I mean that when you talk about knowledge, right? There are people that doesn't that do not need all this knowledge and they are living 
their lives. I was in Guizhou just recently. Uh, there was a poverty alleviation scheme done by the government. They were building uh, houses for the people who are in the mountains and rural areas and bringing them down. I, I visited the, the estate. Uh, the estate housed about 10,000 people. Uh, they didn't speak Mandarin. I said, hello, ni hao, ni hao. They were looking at me like, a, uh, you know, like uh, because they're speaking their own uh, dialects. Mm -hmm. So these are old people. I mean, they are living their lives and there are plenty more of these people in China. And if you apply that to each country's own population of that group of kind of people, then you have that base. And those people do not need the kind of knowledge and the kind of uh, critical thinking and all these things to be able to live their lives. You mentioned, right, what what do we know? We don't know enough to be, and, and we're living our lives. So yeah, these people are living their lives and that's just the way it is. The moment you have knowledge, as they, and this, as they say, right, ignorance is bliss. In, that, in this sense, you can really see how it works. Mm. And sometimes I really wish that I am more ignorant sometimes and mm -hmm. I, can, I can have bliss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because the more you know, then the more you are able to scheme and, you know, devise things. It's all in the mind. Well, the more you know, the more confused you are. The more, That's the paradox, I feel. Um, well, it depends. I, I believe that there's really, really in this world, there is good and bad. Why do we think that the guy who is doing the bad things is the bad guy? Does the guy doing the bad things thinks he's the bad guy? Or does the guy doing the bad things thinks he's the good guy? Yeah. You see? So it will be an argument. And then they, and I hate it when they talk about, you know, the, the, the insanity plea, right? The guy is not, is, is mentally unsound. Hence, it's okay for him to do crazy stuff. I mean, that's, that's, again, it's, it's a, it's a moral thing. Maybe you can't just, you know, pass judgment on a life if, if, if it's really, in, you know, mentally unstable. But uh, I guess, again, 80-20 rule or, you know, even less than that. There's a majority of us that are okay. In fact, even with conflicts around the world and, and whatever things is happening, if we're arguing political stuff, there's 80% of people who don't care what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And they are living their lives. Well, I think most people don't exactly. care. Exactly. Yeah. So why are we getting involved? Because it happens that we have <laughs> too much in our minds. Well, it's right? like what Catherine said with the commenters on, on YouTube. It's the extremists on both ends that are actually commenting. And actually, the vast majority of people aren't commenting. Like, I've never commented on a YouTube video before. But as content creators, both of you, do you guys feel a heavier responsibility on yourselves to, to improve your own critical thinking? Is that something that comes across to you? Like, okay, if I'm making this content and I'm putting it out there, I have a responsibility kind of like... Well, I need, I need to think critically about what I'm doing, what I'm saying, the views I'm promoting, or whatever it is. Like, do you, do you feel a heavier burden? Yeah, and in terms of YouTube, I just don't want to talk politics at all because... Oh, man, how do I put this? Let me think. Oh, you came on the wrong show today. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. Yeah, so on YouTube, I prefer to stay out of political topics about China because, as I'm sure you guys know, if you are going to talk politics about China, there's really only one angle you can give. And if mm. I can't give a full spectrum of concepts i guess like if i can't give a full well-rounded opinion i just don't want to give an opinion at all mm. so i just like how noah went to xinjiang i'm also planning a trip to xinjiang but it's just gonna show people what i see that's it like go on some awesome bike rides show what i see it's not trying to prove that something is or is not because xinjiang is so huge it's like a country it's bigger than a lot of countries on this earth it's so big yeah. there's no way that i could possibly prove that anything is or isn't I'm just going to go and show you people what I see. And if you want to talk about politics in the comments, you do that. But that's just not my place in this channel. I'm not comfortable talking about it if I can't give a well-rounded opinion. And as for Chinese platforms, um, it's kind of caused me a bit of a problem, actually, because I'm so caught up thinking about how commenters may respond to something. Like, I'm afraid of offending people. Like, it's not so much I'm worried that they're going to call me a spy. Like, it's just going to happen no matter what I do. Literally, Well, that's just so ridiculous that you can just, like, you know, throw it aside. It's like... <sighs> yeah, oh, but, yeah. 008 or 007? 
Double eight. Oh, it's a, it's a cultural 007. reference. Oh no, yeah. what is that from? No, double eight because eight pa is is good, good word in China, a good number in China. Yeah, it's a lucky pa. number. But so seven, like is double, seven is too. Seven is taken. Cultural reference. Double I'm seven is taken. James Bond. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen it. You've never seen it? No. You don't. You've never <laughs> seen James Bond. You don't know who Neil deGrasse Tyson is. <laughs> What kind of American are you, Catherine? I've been living under a rock, what can I say? She has been living under a rock, yes. But yeah, for Chinese social media, I'm always worried about offending people. So sometimes I like, I'll just be so careful planning what I'm going to say. And like my boyfriend Wei is like, well, he'll always get really annoyed. He'll be like, just say stuff. It's okay. Like oh, stop hey. making such a big deal about everything. Like mm. it's really okay. But I'm like, oh, I don't want to offend people. Like I'm almost like too worried about it. Well, what, what, are, you, what are you worried about offending them? Like, like in what? terms of certain cultural differences, like mm. if I talk about things in a certain way, people will very easily be like, oh, I'll just go back to the U.S. then if you think the U.S. is better. Yeah. Well, the truth is, I think some things in the U.S., I personally think that, like, I prefer certain things about the U.S. Yeah. And I prefer certain things about China. Like, neither country is 100% perfect. But any, like, cultural differences type video, it's easy for me to get caught in this, like, vortex of, like, oh, my God, I don't want to offend people, like, blah, blah, blah. So then I'll just kind of get stuck in this box and have kind of a difficult time really expressing my like actual thoughts about anything because i'm just worried people will get offended or upset stuff like well, that. that that's a very real fear yeah um it, it's the i mean as much as we talk about the toxicity of like youtube and platforms like that um the the netizens in china can be just if not more toxic um there is i mean they will go after you here too yeah yeah and they they band together and they'll they'll crush you like i've seen it happen i've seen it happen yeah. it, it, it happened gets... to me on a, a tv show that i did really yeah so that tv show that i was actually very worried about this issue throughout the entire thing it was kind of like a talk show between like different foreign girls and two chinese hosts we were all sitting on like chairs in a circle and just kind of talking about all kinds of different social issues so there was this one question it was like does if a, if in China if a woman buys a house can that be used to say that she has achieved, oh what was the thing that they called it I think it was um I don't want to use the word financial freedom because that sounds so like like pyramid scheme you know they always use those words they're like financial freedom you know like the forex traders and stuff <laughs> it yeah. is what it, it is what it is yeah I, I'm like afraid to use that word it's been like tainted to me but that's economic economic independence I guess okay. we can say that yeah so some of the girls on the show made the argument that. If a woman buys a house, because buying a house in Chinese society is so important. In the U.S., it's not that critical. Like, you could rent for your whole life, and it's really not a big deal. But in China, it's such a big deal to buy a house. It's so important. So me and about, I would say about half the other girls on the show, we made this argument that if a woman buys a house, it can be seen as, like, the, uh, like the ultimate definition of economic independence. It, it doesn't say that if you don't have a house, you are not economically independent. It's saying if a woman buys a house, with her own, you know, using her own money. It's not saying like your parent bought it for you. Like if a woman buys a house, that can be used as kind of like the ultimate financial like independence. And people like twisted that on Weibo. Like there was this account, I swear this account only exists to like twist people's words and get like the netizens angry or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they twisted our words and said, according to this show, blah, 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 blah. A woman has to buy a house in order to get economic freedom. What do you think? And it was like a poll. It was like, mm. do you have to buy a house to be economically independent? Or no, I think independence can be defined in various ways. So they totally twisted our words, completely twisted it. And people were freaking out. Like I've never seen anything like it. Like people were all over that little video clip of us. And they were like making this huge deal. And it's like, I didn't even say that. I didn't say that you have to buy a house. All I said was, if you were to buy a house, I think that could be kind of like the ultimate way of showing economic independence. It doesn't mean it's the only way. It's a metric. Welcome yeah. to social media. Oh, yeah. That was the okay. first time I ever got like blasted on social media. It wasn't just me, thankfully. There was another girl in the video too and she was like, whoa. Like, well, uh, was the other girl uh, a Chinese girl or? She's from Malaysia. From Malaysia. Yeah, and she's um, on this really famous debate show. So she does a lot of debates. So you'd think she'd be used to this. But even she was like, wow, <laughs> people mm. are freaking out. But it was just frustrating because that's not what we said. This stupid media outlet intentionally twisted of our course. words just to make people angry. It was so annoying. She's getting a uh, passionate. <laughs> it was so Good. annoying. I was so annoyed. Of course, that but that's the oh name of the game yeah. online now. Like, no. like, uh. like, you you would be too naive to think like, well, this is exactly what I said, and people have to translate exactly what I said verbatim and get what I meant and everything because that never happens. And I I'm equally as frustrated. 
but that never happens. And partially, it's not it's not that they're even trying to do that. They're not even trying to really understand what you're saying. Social media, it, it's a game and it's an algorithm. And if you understand the formula, it's about pushing people's buttons. It's about clickbait. It's about, you know, uh, there's been studies over studies over studies that have shown that negative impressions f spread much more virally than positive ones. Yeah. So what people want to do, especially if they have a social media channel and they want to videos or clips to go viral and get more likes and click views or whatever it is, especially if they're trying to monetize it, they will, they know how to play that game. Yeah. They know how to twist things to make it appear negative, to get people worked up, mischaracterize people and take things out of context intentionally. It's not, they don't even care to, yeah. to, to contextualize you correctly. Yeah. They're, they're after their own agenda and that's for their video to spread. Yeah. And they know how to push those buttons. And that's why, yeah, like it, it does give you pause, right? Like how, as a content creator, it's like, what do you say? Like, 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 how will people twist your words and use it for their own gain is a very, very scary concept and reality. And you can't control it. Yeah. No. So that's kind of gotten in my head about posting on Chinese social media. Like, especially after that happened, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, how can they possibly twist my words? How can they like, what if this blows up on somewhere social media and everyone's like, you know, freaking out that I offended them or whatever. So that's been a bit of a problem on Chinese social media, but on on youtube not so much because my content is very like explore exploration based it's just kind of showing my life being in china i'm sh showing like the amwf relationship lifestyle like amwf she asian she male taught, white taught, females she yeah. taught me that acronym <laughs> yeah what, what is what is amwf oh you don't asian, know no asian male white female <laughs> relationship what what, what? Asian, asian male, male white female Asian male, white female. Relationships, yeah. AMWF. She taught is me that, that a just thing? To, yes, that it a... is. Look up like the AMWF hashtag on Instagram or <laughs> That's Facebook. That's an actual acronym. Oh, no, it's real. I didn't make this up. And it's all over Facebook. Like there's all these AMWF dating groups and stuff. I like, am going to lock myself in a room and go down a deep rabble hole with that hashtag. Oh, go on down there. Yeah, there's oh. tons of Facebook groups and tons of things about it. You really didn't hear about that? I, I don't know. No. Oh, I, my goodness. I, no, I don't. I didn't know about that. Yeah, get on Facebook and Instagram. AMWF. Yes. Oh, that is great. That is beautiful. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is so beautiful. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So it's it's a community of, of people just talking like about like uh, Asian uh, Asian guys dating white females yeah because we're the minority of the like asian white like mixed couples it's almost yeah. all white male asian female yeah. and it's like very uncommon to see the opposite especially when like the woman is from one country and the man was born in another as uh -huh. opposed to like if you're like chinese american with like for example a white american or a black american that's like not quite so extreme so uh there's like two parts of the amwf community one is like we were born and raised in the same country and then there's like another extreme of like one of us literally immigrated somewhere and well, no. that's you. Yeah, that I'm like in that category. But I think all of them are really interesting. Like, I, I really love seeing AMWF content, like on Instagram, on YouTube, on Facebook. Like, it's a it's a mathematical it right <laughs> it's a mathematical permutation. <laughs> it's an anomaly. I, I'm all about it right now. Okay, so this is something I've actually never talked about on the show, but having you here, I'd be remiss not to try to explore this subject with you. Um, growing up in the states as an Asian male, uh, I've, I've always had this, I don't know, this, this feeling of inadequacy, um, social anxiety, because I grew up in a place, um, in New Jersey, in, in my, in my community, there was really no, I didn't really have any Asian friends. Mm. So I was surrounded by all white people, black people, uh, just no Asians. Right. And that was fine. I, like at the time, I never thought anything of it. That's why I grew up. Yeah. But when it came to social activities, especially activities, social like parties or something like that, where there were gonna be uh, girls there, and there was never Asian girls there. It was mm -hmm. in my community. I lived in the suburbs in New Jersey. It was all pretty much white girls. Um. I've and I was like the token Asian guy, right? Oh. I was the token Asian guy. Um, in my, in my community of friends. Okay. Not to say in all of New Jersey. <laughs> um, and I never could put my finger on it at the time, but now I'm very clear that I was just, it was just feelings of inadequacy and social anxiety that I was feeling where I always felt so 
so disproportionately nervous to confront or approach or talk to a white girl mm. versus an Asian girl. And for me, I just felt like there was always this, in my head, I was always just played like the stereotype and the stigma of the Asian male not being a real man's man in American yeah. society and culture, right? Pop culture, movies, Hollywood. They yeah. depict that all the time. And that got to me. Not that I was aware that it was happening, but in hindsight, it definitely got to me where yeah. I would feel like there was no, there would be no way a white girl would be sexually interested in me. Yeah, And that messed me up a lot in terms of like being social. So... From your perspective, because you also grew up in America, right? Yeah. You, you grew up there, right? Yeah. And like, you're a white girl now. Obviously, you're AMWF. You're all about it. You live, you're living it. <laughs> like, from your perspective, what, do you, what goes through your mind when I tell you that? When I tell you, like, my, 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 what I just told you? Sounds like a lot of the guys in the AMWF groups. That's a very common topic of discussion. Like, oh. that's a very real problem. That's a very real problem. Like I've heard that from other like Asian Americans I met back in the U.S. too. I mean, it's real. Like in the U.S., Asian women tend to be viewed as like this sex object. Uh, it's so easy to like walk into like offensive territory here. Like people in the U.S. get offended so easily. But for real though, it's I mean, Asian women are seen as being like this exotic, beautiful. Hy thing. They're hypersexualized. Yeah. Yes, they're exactly. Hyper and people tend to have these associations with them that they're going to be so obedient, and, like this perfect wife, and like you know, there's all kinds of quote unquote positive associations with Asian women that would make a man drawn to them. But as for Asian men, I mean media really hasn't <laughs> media's given them the short end of the stick, you know? Like Well, quite literally, because yeah. <laughs> there's the small penis stereotype. Yes, I was gonna bring that up. Like, yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Like, I mean that's, that's exactly the that's short end of the stick. That's literally the short end of the stick. Yeah. Um and not only the small penis stereotype, but there's like the nerdy, weak, yeah, unathletic. Haven't they watched Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan? But but see that's also another stereotype. Because my friend who's a film director, he's part, he's a co-host Howie on the show. He brings this up all the time because when we we talk about Hollywood, and he's like, yes, but the only roles that Asian leads get are like kung fu oh. kung fu people. Okay. Yeah, like I mean that's that's it. Yeah, okay. and they're never sexualized. Yeah, right. They're never like you never see them romantically like kissing, and there's never like really a love scene with a. A non-Asian counterpart. It's you know, it's and never that, really. And that's brainwashing in itself. It's brainwashing. But yeah. then my other co-host Eric, he 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 argues on the other. He doesn't argue on this side, but he plays devil devil's advocate, and he's like, it's reflective of the proportion of, you know, people who are in Hollywood, right? Like how many Asian actors compared to like white actors, black actors, you know, Latino actors, whatever are there and there's just a smaller percentage Agreed. and population of them um so like why would we get all these like leading man roles like it just doesn't depict i guess the the percentages i guess i don't know that's that's i think what he would say i might yeah. be misquoting him yeah but i don't know like yeah. going back to what you're yeah, saying like, so, so, so it's a very common thing yeah I, and i would assume it's a very common thing but then like i have friends i have a friend who I've I've said this too, and he like doesn't get it. He's like, no way, man! Like I'm dating white girls all the time. Like you know, yeah. and he's Asian, he's Korean. Yeah, I do know a couple of those kind of. They're guys. full of yeah. confidence. <laughs> I don't know like what it is that makes them different from everyone else. I know two guys like that that have just no problem at all, no no issue. But I would say at least from what I've seen in the AMWF chats or what you know, I've met a lot of Asian American guys, especially when I was in college. There weren't a whole lot of them in my hometown. But the overall opinion that I get or the overall feedback I hear from them is that like, yeah, I do have this sense of being inferior, like society kind of pushes this feeling on me, especially about like bedroom stereotypes and stuff like that. Is that only yeah. in Western countries, like uh, Asian guys who've grown up in the West? Yeah. Yeah. I'm mostly talking about like Asian American guys. OK, so like you. OK, there's so much I want to I want to ask. You right now. <laughs> but like one, let's start here first. Like, OK, so that's an. That's an uh, that's a Western thing, maybe. Yeah. Like you being an Asian, uh, I mean, a white female in China. Um, do you get the feeling ever at all that Chinese guys are ever like shy to approach you? Um, you know, maybe even before when you were single, or even if like people are flirting with you now, like, like is is do you get the same feeling, or do you feel like there's not because there's not that same social stigma here? 
obviously with Asian guys here in China. So do you feel like there's a, a, a higher level of confidence, I guess, with Asian males? I think their hesitance to approach me might not, might not be based on the same things as in Western society. It may be based more on like they're afraid I don't speak Chinese or they don't know how to deal with the cultural differences because a lot of Chinese guys just seem to be unaware of what they're thought of, how they're thought of in the West. Like I have this one friend here who's, how how would you say, I guess kind of like a lady killer, (laughs) you know, and he wants to go uh, travel to the U S for like a semester kind of thing. He's got some program with his professor and he wants to go to the U S and you know, he was just talking about how he's going to get all these chicks. And like, we had to have a conversation about this. I was like, okay, like, I'm glad you're really confident. It's but a Chinese guy. He is Chinese. Okay. Yeah. And I was like, are you aware though of the obstacles you may face? Like, it's not going to be as easy for you as it is here. Like, I just hope you are aware of that. We had like a whole conversation. He was just like, what? Like, <laughs> it was like, news to like him, right? yeah, like, especially <laughs> like the bedroom kind of stuff. He was just like, what? Like, you don't know. You've never experienced me. I'm like, yeah, I know they haven't, but that's just what people think and i've gotten those comments from people i mean obviously they're not like good friends like friends wouldn't say shit like that but like old classmates and stuff were like oh like your boyfriends he must be so small or like whatever like really yes people say that so what are you gonna do oh my god yeah it's real but i think a lot of chinese people may not be aware and it's also because i don't think europe and especially places like ukraine and russia and stuff they don't have like so many negative stereotypes towards asian asian guys like it seems to be a very like u.s based issue like this doesn't seem to be as serious in europe and especially in like well Ukraine i think probably in the uk yeah. is probably the same, same yeah. deal i would assume but i don't know like okay because i i always get in I've, I've gotten into this debate many times with this korean friend of mine and i'm trying to present like he's full of confidence and i try to present him like well there is some truth to the fear or anxiety that we have there there is that thing that stigma going around in American society. Yeah. Uh, not to say it's right or not to say we should buy into it, but it is there to a degree. And he's and he denies it. He's like, no. He's like, no, it's all in your head, bro. It's like it's all in your head. Like, like, like white girls, like they, they, they're Asian guys too. It's like it's like we're just like, you know, if you're good looking, you're good looking. It doesn't matter what race you are. Is this guy exceptionally good looking? He would say he is. What about like you though, as an outsider, do you think? Because I mean one of the guys I've met in the U.S. who had no problem getting girls, I mean, he was very, very handsome, like okay. exceptionally handsome. Like he he was one of my good friends back in college and he came over to my house for our Thanksgiving mm-hmm. and he came, on, he came over and my mother was like, whoa, like, can you wow. like pick this one? Like, you know, <laughs> she was like, he is gorgeous. So he should uh, yeah. audition to be a Hollywood actor and help the uh, <laughs> Asian thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very, very much so. Oh, yeah. He's... I need to see a picture of this guy. Do you have a picture of this guy after the show? <laughs> I can show you a picture. Uh, to be honest, the pictures aren't very flattering. But in in person, he, he just has like the perfect like muscles and chest and like really nice cut face like he's just a good looking guy i'm already forming the image in my head <laughs> he's, he's <laughs> like just a, a chinese good brad pitt guy. or something like yeah, that he doesn't look very good in pictures though so i feel like you'll see the picture and be like eh. he's not photogenic but he's not he doesn't look that good in pictures but in person like you know my mother's pretty picky like she does she's not afraid of giving her opinion that my current boyfriend is not mm-hmm. very attractive like she's not afraid of just putting it out there but if she saw him she was like "Ooh, he's handsome okay so from your perspective because i'm sure because you're kind of like an outlier almost. I'm sure you have um, plenty of other um, white female friends um, yeah. that may not be share the same perspective or tastes you do, I guess. Yeah. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, and you interact with them, and I'm sure you, you're very well aware. When it comes to what we're talking about and the stigma that Asian men carry, let's say, in America... I mean, is there is there truth in that in terms of there are you there are plenty of white girls that maybe you know or maybe even the majority of them I don't know that would not to say that they would never date an Asian guy yeah but that they would that the the bar is a little bit different with Asian guys or do you think that's a entirely just an, a stereotype? To be honest, I'm not even sure how to answer that because all of my close friends from high school, they've never dated Asian guys or even acted the slightest bit interested in an Asian guy. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so it's just like, I'm not even sure how to... Well, that's your answer that... right there. But that's yeah. your answer right there. That's yeah. your answer right yeah. there, right? Yeah, yeah. They've only acted... You know, I've got a couple of friends that are really into like K-pop drama stuff. So if they happen to see a guy who looked like one of those guys, I think it, the story might be a little bit different. But your average Asian guy doesn't look like that. So they've just never expressed any interest whatsoever at all. So... 
Well, I that's, just don't know. That's, that's the answer right there. Like, yeah. no, you're like what well, you said. <laughs> There's no. your answer. Wow. Wow. So was so I'm assuming that that was never an issue with you or was that like are, were you just always different or w was it something what an experience that you had or whatever that kind of made you an outlier in this way? I think she's just very open minded. The fact that she's in China right well, now. Being open minded is one thing. <laughs> There's plenty of people that are very open minded. But when it comes to sexually or sexual attraction, I mean, sexual attraction is not something you can control. Yeah. Right. Obviously, that's not like your your, your sexuality is not something you choose. Right. Like you, you, you are the way you are and that's it. Yeah. Um, so it's not a choice thing. So yeah. uh, so to me, it's not really that has nothing to do with how open minded you are, because you can be the most open minded person in the world. But your sexual attraction is your sexual attraction. That's like yeah. that's what it is. OK. So were it, did it were you always this way i guess or no. something changed no. no i was not and i actually oh. remember like the moment when i guess i like what? changed or yeah it was this very specific moment Tell so us the moment yes ever since i was younger like i don't know i was never attracted to guys my own age i always liked older men like 30s 40s 50s like i always was really? how older, older were you when wow. you liked 30 40s 50s oh my God, i was in third grade crushing on oh. alex trebek okay what the oh wow <laughs> yeah she's, she's different you were in third grade crushing <laughs> on guys alex in trebek. middle age guys yes yes i could never find guys my own age attractive um all the way through like middle school elementary school high school i only had a crush on maybe like two guys i knew <laughs> alex trebek yeah oh everyone was talking about zach efron and how cute he is and i was like alex trebek i watched jeopardy like religiously <laughs> yeah i i just thought he was there? gorgeous yeah <laughs> i thought he was just the most gorgeous thing and i really like pat sajak from wheel of fortune oh so you know those pat shows sajak. were back to bat yeah so, pat sajak i know wheel of fortune the wheel, yeah. Vanna. pat sajak was like the appetizer and then alex trebek was like the main dish yeah Wow! I loved older men. I could not wow. get attracted to guys my own age, and wow. this just went okay. on and on and on. I started thinking, like, what is wrong with me? Like, why don't I like There's guys my own age? There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, Alex Trebek is a. Are you still this well, way? No, I'm getting that. Okay, okay. Well, I, you know, older men are beautiful, but I did eventually find a, a way out of this problem. Was when I was in high school. There was this one day I was just walking in the hallway. Yeah, high school was the same the same way. I thought my teachers were gorgeous. Our our school did have really... You would have been a real problem. <laughs> you would have been a real problem. Oh, we had the most handsome teachers and I would like play chess with my teachers just to get an excuse to like hang out with them with like this. Had you would this pose such... a real real oh. She'll get people in pro in yeah. trouble. Yes, exactly. You no, would be I a never, huge problem. Huge I never liability. I never acted out. I would just would like secretly be like, Oh, he's so handsome and find all these excuses, like play chess together or, or whatever, like yeah. So one day I was walking through the hallway and I saw the most gorgeous boy, my age for once. But he was like, I believe his family was from Lebanon. It was somewhere in the Middle East. He was like mm. some kind of Middle Eastern American. And it had never occurred to me to look at any race other than white guys. Mm. Ever since I was younger, I'd only been looking at white guys. And then all of a sudden I saw the most beautiful Middle Eastern boy. And I was like, wow, like life changed right there i was like oh my goodness like duh there's so many different types of people in this world like why because i'm white i have to pick a white person like there's so many like this might sound like obvious but to me it really wasn't like i was just like i guess in, it was just ingrained in my mind to pick a white person just like my parents and my grandparents and everybody else did and i saw this beautiful boy and i was like oh my goodness that's right duh there's all these other places with all these other beautiful boys and just from that day on i was like I just found an appreciation for guys in the Middle East, or Indian guys, Asian guys, just like the whole, the whole Asian continent, I guess. I was just like, wow, there's so many beautiful men out there. And I'd never opened my eyes up to that You had before. leveled the playing field for guys. <laughs> well, in her, in her own yeah. mind. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the playing field still wasn't level was, for us. It was us, just me. Noel. It was just For people me. like me and you, it was yeah, not level yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't level. <laughs> Okay, so who was your first? Um, okay, because I I, I want to, uh, in to be accurate, right? Like Middle Eastern people are part of the Asian continent, I yeah, guess. Yeah. Um, but let's just for the sake of argument, for to simplify, Sorry, let's just which say is why the Xinjiang guys are really really gorgeous. <gasps> oh no, they're really no, yeah. they're, they're really they're really <laughs> good looking. The women yes, there are, really are actually really good looking too. <laughs> yes. Because they're like really mixed. They have that mixed look and yes. it's really exotic. It's like East Asia meets oh, Middle yeah, East yeah, yeah, like yeah, in the perfect way. Oh, oh. I, I'd be crushing on them too. Yes. I was quite like interested in Middle Eastern and Indian guys for <laughs> a long time. You were all about them for a while. Yeah, I, I learned Hindi for two years just to pick up boys in university. That's she, why I learned Hindi. She explained Hindi. that in, a, in a videos, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I, want, I wanted to be able to pick up cute boys at my university. I knew it was a technology school. 
and there would be a lot of foreign students. So I uh, learned Hindi. I learned it quite quite well, actually. I was quite good at Hindi, but that's another. That's how how well is your Hindi now? Terrible. Mandarin killed it. Uh, Mandarin just like uh, sat on it. Because there's, like, al- <laughs> there's almost so much capacity and storage in your brain, yeah. right? Like when you're learning in such a complex language. Yeah. Unless you are gifted. Like I'm, not gifted. Well, unless right. you're using I'm it, not gifted. Unless you're using it. Unless you're using it every day. No, you're pretty gifted. You're no, if you were still yeah. using Hindi every yeah, day. Yeah, that was the problem know. was that I just couldn't find a way to, like, it was focused on one or the other. I was living in the U.S., so it's really hard to be focusing on two at once. So I just had to, like, let Hindi just kind of get buried for a while. I think if I went to India for a few months, I could, like, resurrect it, you mm. know? But for now, it's just kind of like... Thank goodness you're in China. <laughs> yeah. Spread, yeah. Spread the gospel here, <laughs> Catherine. Okay, so wait, so your your first Far East Asian crush came five years after the and who was it? was this a random pit kid or was it like a celebrity or I'm trying to think who it was it was um either someone from my lab group or like some other guy like met on Tinder like I'm kind of like struggling to like Tinder yeah oh I, I was a beast on Tinder I prowled wait how long ago was well, this? this is this one set of Catherine that I know when I was growing man. up Tinder wasn't around yet <laughs> well I was in college she's pretty young she's okay this yeah. was college like my second year of college it was I don't remember exactly who it was to be honest it was it was either someone in my lab or someone off Tinder so who was the first Far East Asian guy you dated like was it in in the states you dated yeah or in the US in the US he was from Shandong province so like yeah. legit Chinese, yeah. homegrown yeah. Far East home Asian. Grown. <laughs> you wanted the authentic stuff. Yeah, she mentioned that yeah. in a video as well. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was my. Everything's in the videos, man. Third you... or fourth year of third year of university. Yeah. Okay, so we gotta check out your videos because yeah. you go in depth about all this. I'm oh assuming. no, I didn't go in depth about him. Well, not just... yet. Not yet. Maybe another time. Though, that's so <laughs> that that's fascinating because I would assume my ignorant side of my brain would assume that for you to like have your first dabble <laughs> into like like with a far east asian guy you would pick like an abc like someone like me right uh-huh. like, like no, i like, went all in <laughs> yeah you went all in you <laughs> yeah. didn't you didn't want any of that pf changs you wanted the authentic yeah. authentic food well because remember i'd already had my like gateway drug of hindi right so like through hindi i was i wasn't meeting indian american guys i was meeting like guys from india i was going like all these dates with indian and pakistani guys like I was wow. I was already wow. living that life. I mean, I think your experience it's encouraging in in a lot of ways, I guess. It's encouraging in a lot of ways, but obviously at the same time we know and I think even you would say that yeah. there is that amongst like let's say Caucasian women in America there is that there is that perceived stereotype, that stigma yeah. when they look at many Asian men. Yeah. Do you think that's changing? Do you think that's gotten a lot better recently? I wouldn't use the word a lot. Uh, maybe it's gotten better. Because, I mean, AMWF, like, it's a real thing, but it's just, it is still very much in its own little bubble, kind of. You know, there are those couples, but, I mean, even you didn't know about know. So if you search AMWF, you will see all these couples and be like, wow, there's so many of them. But if you actually look out in society, how many AMWF couples do I know that I did not meet through an AMWF group? Like, two? Like, I, I don't know anybody. I mean, all of the AMWF couples I met have basically been through that group. There's my one, you know, those couple guys I knew in college that have dated a lot of white girls. But really, there's there's just not a lot of them. I only know one. And it's that Korean friend I mentioned earlier mm. uh, um, dating a lovely white girl. They're engaged now, actually. Mm. Um, so, yeah. And she's, like, from middle America, you know, mm. um, homegrown. So, yeah, I mean, it does... There, there is, there is, it is out there. Yeah. I'm just saying statistically, it's, yeah, it's yeah. very few. And most of the ones I know of, I mean, I've seen them on like social media, but we don't really know each other in person. Like, like just from people I met completely organically through my university or through like social clubs and meetings. I mean, there's just very few of them. Well, I think the argument is, the argument is this, is that because of the perceived stereotypes and stigma, whether it's real or not real, whatever you believe, Either way, that Asian men in America, statistically, probably fewer of them um, have the confidence to approach non-Asian women. And by doing so, they're limiting their own chances. If, like, if Asian men were, like, freaking Italians and just, like, all about women, like, you know, like, just, like, 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 you know, like, like, huge personalities and, like, full of confidence to approach girls and just didn't give a shit maybe those the the rates of amwf would rise drastically yeah, possibly yeah that's the argument right that it's like self-perpetuating 
Yeah. No way. I don't know. What about Noel? You've been quiet. Like, like you're an Asian guy. Like, did you have any of this growing up? Uh, well, in Singapore, it's a little different. In Singapore, it's very different. Yeah. And I would like to say that uh, in uh, me growing up, I always perceive uh, the white people as like, again, superior. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Even in Singapore? For me, for, for me I, I don't okay, speak okay. for everybody. Okay, okay. It's for myself, right? Because uh, I guess the media that is showing all the television dramas and movies, mo mostly from Hollywood. And, you know, when, like I said, when, when we meet a white foreigner, a white person, an American, basically, I would notice that myself and some friends, we would speak in an accent that tries to mimic an American accent to course to converse with the person. And you did this subconsciously? Yes, or sub was it subconsciously. Like we, we, we will not speak our Singlish or our normal English when we, well, when I face with a, with a mm -hmm. American. So I'll try to up, so-called up my uh, English uh, sound or wow. whatever, right? To try to, that, that's, that's me. But of course, as I grow along, I try to just speak my own way. As, as I'm speaking to you now, I wouldn't go into say like a, Oh yeah, man. Yeah. So, uh, how are you doing today? You know, like, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, you... Is that what you guys used to <laughs> no, do? No, yeah. Is that how you think no, Americans no, talk? No, no, no. We okay. So back in the day, as kids, that that was our best. Yeah, uh, I get it. You know, like oh uh, trying gosh. to do. It. No, serious. I'm serious. So yeah, that's serious. Yeah. But as you grew up, you found out how ridiculous that was, right? Exactly. Or, yeah. Exactly. Well, I think that's that's like Western imperialism, right? Like I think. Yeah. A lot yeah. of that in. You know, it kind of you can find probably trace that back to like, you know, Western countries and powers colonizing a lot of Ex different countries exactly. all over the world. So the more we grow up and the more we dig into history, and if we have a keen mind to learn, then we'll discover more things. And again, that either enriches or degrades the mind further, <laughs> <laughs> versus being ignorant and you can just you know live life every day just being happy. Yeah. Well, like growing up, did you ever approach, and obviously I'm presuming a lot about you, and if I am, forgive me. No worries. Just tell me. But did you, uh, did you approach like any like, uh, like white girls or non-Asian girls at all? Never. Never? There was never a chance. There was, uh, in Singapore, there's no uh, readily available white Asian, white yeah, girls. Yeah, they're there. a minority there So yeah, so in, so in Singapore, there's basically no way. Yeah. Um, and I've not gone abroad in the universities like Australia, US, to have a chance to do that. So for me, predominantly my life is all no chance to interact with any other female aside from being Chinese, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. No, no, that makes sense. Yeah, especially in some place like Singapore, for sure. Yeah. What's, what's like the future of your channels? Like, what do you guys want to get from your channels in terms of what is the message that you ultimately want to deliver? Well, for me, I want to continue doing my experiences in China. So right now, it's been a little bit, uh, I guess, mundane because after the Xinjiang trip, I haven't actually gone anywhere that's exciting, so to speak. Uh, I will continue to go visit places in China for my own enrichment. At the same time, to you know, video things that's interesting over there. Like Catherine said, right? If she goes to Xinjiang, she's going to just video the normal life there. She's she's not going to prove that something is, is or isn't. She's not going with an agenda. Exactly. So same thing for me. I'm just going to go and show at least uh, the stuff that I think should be mentioned that people outside of China are unknown to. They don't have the knowledge about. And I, and, and I hope that if people chance by my channel, they can see it and they can maybe decide for themselves if, uh, you know, this is worth something for them to digest and, you know, probably enrich them educationally. That's it. What about you, Catherine? Kind of similar, I guess. Like, I also want to do a lot more travels, especially after I graduate. I'll be graduating in a couple of months. So I have some really long bike trips planned. Like, I want to go through Guangxi province, Guangdong province, Fujian, like Yunnan. I want to just, go on these long like multi-week bike trips and just see everything and interact with people and just show everyone there's more to China than 
what you see on the media. Like, you know, the media <laughs> loves to complain, but every every country is a, like a multifaceted thing. Like, there's good and bad things happening everywhere. You know, the media just plants this like unhealthy like seed of hatred in us. You know, like it's just I just want to show people what life is like for the actual people in China. You know, like put the politics aside. Just look at this is a country with 1.2 billion people. How could all of them just be living in like this this terrible conditions that the media is acting like? You know, I mean. There are people living happy lives here, productive lives here. There's so many great stories and interesting things happening. So I just want to share that with people and, you know, maybe inspire some people to do some more exploring on their own, you know, because the stuff that I do, like the bike trips around Nanjing, it's really not that complicated. Like it's just me and my bike and the map app, you know, I'll just like get to navigate my little trail around and just go explore, you know, just create your own adventure. There's so many great things you can find around any city or around anywhere you don't necessarily have to go to a tourist destination to find interesting stuff so that's what i'm really excited about with the long bike tours and my like ultimate dream bike tour is to go from shangri-la to singapore it's like a three month long trip but of which course, i'm uh, gonna be joining you yes <laughs> that would be awesome that's, that's my awesome. ultimate dream but again it depends on the pandemic and everything you know right now it's not really possible to go through all those southeast asian countries but uh -oh. That's like the thing I want to like build up towards is that. So yeah, there's a lot of plans for the future. That's awesome. Uh, when's when's your trip to Xinjiang? As soon as possible. Like I'm just stuck right now because of my thesis needs to be approved. I need to do my defense, but sometime in like July or August, basically, I wanted to do it in June, but I'm just completely stuck because of school. So it's just whenever my defense and my thesis stuff is over, going to Xinjiang. Okay, so. Before we wrap it up real quick, because I want to, because you, you were recently in Xinjiang, obviously, Noel, you uh, did a series of videos from there. Um, and there's, I feel like there's a lot of misinformation, even myself, I'm confused about um, what it takes to get to Xinjiang. Obviously, for local Chinese people, they can fly there just like they would fly to any city. There's really no restrictions. Um, for you being a foreigner, were there any restrictions? Were there, was there any red tape you had to get over or get across? No. No, not yeah, at all. No, there's no permits to apply for. Okay. And the only thing that uh, you need to look out for is the hotels that accept foreigners because it's a during guess, COVID, right? Yeah, no. But that's not just Xinjiang. That's everywhere. Yeah, yeah I guess so. Okay. I guess so. Yeah. And uh, for those who are married, make sure and yeah, for yeah, if you're married, foreigners, you make sure you bring your uh, wedding certificate. Why? Why do you need to know? Why? why yeah, is because that they important? need to they need to validate that you guys are married to be in the same room. It's a true story. Isn't that interesting? I'm you told me about that too, and I was like, what? My travel partner is a married man and is that because of the Muslim tradition? I, I, I would Probably, surmise yeah. so. I would surmise Probably. so. Yeah. I don't know that I don't have the uh, black and white, but yeah, my uh I was there, I saw it myself, I heard it myself. Uh we checked into the hotel in Kashka. My traveling uh, companion and his wife were checking in, and the receptionist asked them for their wedding certificate. And they brought it because they were pre-informed to bring everything that could prove that they are living in China for a long time. Mm. But apart from that, uh, and then being patient when you are stopped and checked as a foreigner, they will check your passport, they will check your train ticket or your whatever ticket, they will ask you for your phone number, they will be calling to their headquarters uh, and radioing, and it will take some time. Just be patient. Well, where, where is this happening? So, in any, the train stations and yeah, the airports, like train, or on the streets? Train station, train station at points of entry. Okay. Points so, of if, entry. You're, if you're entering into somewhere, mm -hmm. so if you've entered from, for, for me, I, I I went, I took a overnight train from uh, Uramchi to Kashgar. So, when I stopped at Kashgar, there is an entry point, and we were checked by the local police there because we were foreigners. They did the checks. They did. They asked for the phone numbers. They asked for the passports. They were doing their thing. And then even after we were let go, we were called on the phone. We were asked where we were and the police were going to our location to have a chat with us again just to consolidate Oh, Co just to verify just the, just the what you're saying is true, right? Well, like, I don't know. They want to verify Whatever they do, they're, they're doing like... their thing, right? Okay. They're doing their thing. So you will probably experience this kind of stuff, but just be patient. They're doing their job. You're a foreigner. Xinjiang is a sensitive area, Kashgar especially. So just cooperate 
don't need to be impatient, don't have to be, uh, you know, uh, irritated, and you'll be on your way. That's it. What do you think that is? Do you think that's because a lot of Western journalists try, try to sneak in to, to, to film, like, whatever in and my spin opinion, their, their In my narrative? opinion, yes, they are concerned about uh, media, you know, doing false uh, narrative on Xinjiang. Because it's and happened several times already, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, uh, they are concerned about keeping the peace because there have been uh, those riots back in the day. Mm. So any foreign entity could be the one coming in to try to incite stuff. So who knows? Yeah. Nobody knows, right? They don't know me. I'm going there to vlog. They don't know that, right? So just bear that in mind, right? Yeah, Please yeah. be I'm very patient. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, you went through all the checks but you were still able to go wherever you wanted exactly, to go. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, as long as you are complying to whatever they ask for, you are free to go wherever you want. So your YouTube channels, no. How do people find your channel? Um, YouTube uh, sl uh, slash Noel Lee 89 so N-O-E-L-L-E-E -E -E 89. Or just type in Noel Lee in the search bar. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Catherine, what about yours? What's your channel called? Catherine's Journey to the East. So just search that in the bar or Yang Li's the Dong Ji. Yeah. Awesome. So are you guys on uh what whether like our Chinese media uh social media platforms you guys are on? Uh, not for me, but she is. Yeah, yeah. Which uh, ones? for Billy Billy it's what's Yang Li mm, okay. Great. Thank you both for coming on the show. Thank you, Justin. Thanks for it inviting us. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. I had a blast. And I hope to do it again sometime. Great. Okay. All right guys. Cheers one more time. All right. Oh, Catherine, maybe you want to pour some in his cup if you're I have a cold, so I don't know if I it's want to. It's fine. Oh, okay, it okay. kills the cold. Are you sure? Yeah. Does it, though? Yeah, it kills. It kills. Okay. If you yeah. get a cold, don't All come right. for me. All right. Cheers. <laughs> cheers. Cheers. All right, everybody. That was Noel. That was Catherine. It's the honest drink. Be good. Be well. Love you all. Peace. The rise of the sun will see.